Today, we're talking about my own two-part paper on Bayesianism, which I published in Philosophy Compass about a decade ago. I'll do the first part of this paper in this video and the second part in the next video. If you want to know how to pronounce my name, I'm not necessarily the best person to ask. I say Kenny Iswaran, but you could also say Ishvaran, and probably many people from South Asia will have a better sense of how to pronounce my name than I do. At the time this paper was published, I was at the University of Southern California, as it says there, but I've been a professor at Texas A&M since 2014. And suppose, I guess, depending on how far in the future you're watching this, it's possible I'll be somewhere else. I'll link to my website in the description, which will have updated information. This paper appeared in the journal Philosophy Compass, which is a journal that aims to help people find their way around the literature on a topic, hence the name. As a result, some parts of this paper don't go into a lot of detail and instead just consist of a lot of pointers to other philosophical papers on these topics that existed at the time that this was published. I'll include links to some of these papers in the description. Before I start in on the paper, I'll say a little bit more about the topic. The term Bayesianism is perhaps even more confusing to pronounce than my own name just from seeing it on the page, but it becomes a bit easier when you see that it's named after Thomas Bayes. Uh, I would have included the standard portrait of him that's out there, but it turns out that the portrait that you sometimes see of Thomas Bayes was first published in the 1930s, and it, uh, it clearly depicts someone who's got a 19th century hairstyle and outfit and no wig, and therefore is very unlikely to be a picture of a Presbyterian minister from the early 1700s, who Thomas Bayes was. Bayes was a minister in England who published two papers during his lifetime. One of these papers aimed to prove that God's central aim is the happiness of all creation. And the other paper he published was attempting to defend the logical methods that Isaac Newton used in developing calculus from the criticisms of Bishop Berkeley. However, the work that he's most known for today, an essay towards solving a problem in the doctrine of chances, uh, this was published after his death. Mathematicians and philosophers before his time had worked out how to calculate the probability of various sequences of observations if you already knew the chances of each individual event. So they could work out the probability of various sorts of dice rolls or card shuffles or things like that. But in this paper, Bayes was interested in the reverse calculation. How do you find out about the chances if all you have is a sequence of observations? And so, Here's an example. Imagine that you've picked up a coin in a magic shop and you haven't looked at it closely. Now you flip it three times and it happens to come up heads all three times. David Hume, an important philosopher of the 1700s, made an argument that you can never be justified in believing anything about how this coin will behave in the future based on what happened on this particular occasion. Uh, However, Thomas Bayes thought there is something that we can say. And so first, we can work out these probabilities that if the coin is fair, then the probability of getting three heads in a row is one eighth. So this notation is probability of three heads given that the coin is fair. This is a conditional probability, which we'll talk a lot more about as I get through the paper. And the reason we get one eighth is because there's eight possible sequences of flips. Heads, 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 tails, heads, tails, heads, and so on. And each of them we think is equally likely if the coin is fair. If the coin, however, is double headed, if it's got heads on both sides, then the probability of getting three heads is one. It's absolutely certain that this is the only outcome you'll get. Now, the idea is that these two probabilities show that it doesn't prove that the coin is double sided. It could be either way, and this could have happened. But it seems like we should be able to say that this helps the hypothesis of the coin being double-sided somehow. And the important innovation that Bayes had is that just as we can say that there is a probability of the coin coming up in a certain way, we can say in another sense there's a probability that the coin was fair or that the coin was double-sided. And he says the Bayesian probability of the coin being double-sided is going to go up by a factor of eight compared to the Bayesian probability of the coin being fair. 
And the idea is that these Bayesian probabilities about the, uh, about the hypotheses themselves are going to change in the same ratio as the chances of the evidence that we've observed. And the important thing to note is this Bayesian probability is very different from the probability of the outcome. The coin you picked up either is a double-headed coin or it is a fair coin. There's nothing random about that at all. There might not even be any double-headed coins in this magic shop. You just don't know. This Bayesian probability reflects your uncertainty about the hypothesis, while the probabilities of the coin flips are supposed to reflect some sort of objective chance or randomness in the world. Bayesianism is the idea that these Bayesian probabilities can do most of the work for us that we used to do with the concept of belief. Hume argued that belief in an unobservable universal hypothesis could never be justified on the basis of individual observations. But Bayesians, people who accept this Bayesian probability, say that changes in Bayesian probabilities can be justified on the basis of individual observations, and that this is what really matters. While Bayes himself focused on hypotheses that give us explicit mathematical chances of various outcomes, things like the coin being fair or the coin being double-sided, the idea of Bayesian probability has been extended to many other hypotheses that don't give mathematically precise chances, like the Bayesian probability that God exists, or the Bayesian probability that a Republican will win the next presidential election, or the Bayesian probability that the war in Ukraine will be resolved this year, or the Bayesian probability that there will be another pandemic as significant as COVID in the next decade. One controversy among Bayesians is whether there are objectively correct Bayesian probabilities to have, or whether these probabilities are just purely subjective representations of your own biases and opinions. Bayesians agree about how you should change these probabilities when you gather evidence. When you see three heads, the Bayesian probability of double-sided should go up by a factor of eight compared to fair. But they don't agree about whether there was a correct prior probability to have before you observed the heads. Obviously, this prior probability would be different if you picked up a coin in a magic shop versus picking up a coin on the street. In the magic shop, you'd think the probability of it being double-headed is higher than just for a random coin on the street. But is there some objectively correct prior probability to have? In this paper, I'm not going to work out many of the details of how to do the mathematical calculations with probabilities. There's lots of other YouTube videos for that, and I'll link to some of them in the description. Instead, in this paper, I focus on the philosophical issues around the concept of Bayesian probability. In the first part of this paper, which I'm going to discuss in this video, I focus on the first set of issues. What are the philosophical assumptions that we need to make to say that there is such a thing as Bayesian probability? Why does it make sense to call this thing a probability? What, how does Bayesian probability relate to rational action in an uncertain world? Could there be an alternate way to justify Bayesian probability for creatures that care only about truth rather than about action in the world? In the second part of the paper, which I'll discuss in the next video, I deal with questions about what Bayesian probability means for scientific reasoning, some significant challenges for Bayesian probability as a concept of knowledge or uncertainty, what Bayesianism means for epistemology and for statistics, and some brief discussion of what alternatives to Bayesianism look like in different academic disciplines. There's a whole lot more to say about Bayesianism than I can cover in these, these two papers and the two associated videos. But fortunately, there's a whole world of Bayesians out there in many different academic fields and all over the internet. So you can find out a lot more about this if you look around, but this paper and this pair of papers gives an overview of some of the central philosophical issues for Bayesianism. Okay, so now let's begin. Bayesianism is a collection of positions in several related fields centered on the interpretation of probability as something like degree of belief, as contrasted with relative frequency or objective chance. So the idea here, this is that point that I was just saying, that Bayesianism says probability 
is a measure of your uncertainty or belief. It's not only a measure of how often does something happen? What fraction of things are a certain way? What is the chance of a certain random outcome happening? We can also have probability for things that don't involve randomness, uncertainty, or frequencies at all. However, Bayesianism is far from a unified movement. Bayesians are divided about the nature of the probability functions that they discuss, about the normative force of this probability function for ordinary reasoning and scientific reasoning and decision making, and about what relation, if any, holds between Bayesian and non Bayesian concepts. The core ideas that most Bayesians can agree on are roughly the following, which I'll discuss in more detail later on. One, there is an important mental attitude of degree of belief or credence that can often be given numerical values. This is the idea that we're going to call Bayesian probability. We might also use the word confidence, but the idea is that it's something that can be stronger or weaker that is about your beliefs. Two, for an agent to be perfectly rational, her degrees of belief must obey the axioms of probability theory. And we'll get into the details of what those say later, but this is what makes it Bayesian probability, even though there's no chances or frequencies or anything like that involved. It still obeys the same mathematics as those other concepts, and that mathematics is what we call probability. Three, conditionalization, which is going to be described later, or at least some close relative of it, is the standard way that beliefs change over time. And this is the basic idea that Bayes was arguing for in his paper, that once you have some Bayesian probabilities and you observe some evidence, that evidence will change these Bayesian probabilities in a way that is logically determined given what those Bayesian probabilities were like before you observed the evidence. And we'll talk about what that rule looks like in detail. The first claim that there is such a thing as degree of belief is the central claim of Bayesianism. Though there is disagreement about whether degree of belief is the only important doxastic and epistemic attitude. Doxastic is the adjective from Greek meaning having to do with belief. Epistemic is the adjective from Greek meaning having to do with knowledge. Uh, and so there's disagreement about whether this degree of belief, this Bayesian probability is the only important doxastic and epistemic attitude or whether others are important as well. That is, philosophers have for centuries talked about believing things and knowing things and having opinions about things. And some Bayesians want to say, let's get rid of all that talk and just talk about Bayesian probability while other Bayesians think, no, those things each play important roles in our reasoning. The second claim that Bayesian probability really is a type of probability gives rationality conditions that degrees of belief must satisfy at a time, synchronically. That's again, the Greek word for at the same time. So at any moment, your degrees of belief should be related to each other in a way that makes them coherent, that makes them line up with a probability function. The third claim gives conditions on how these degrees of belief must relate across time, diachronically. So it says, if at the earlier time your Bayesian probabilities were like this, then after your evidence, they should be like that. While the second claim about probability is just saying what they have to be like at a time. Omitting this third claim about how beliefs are updated is a weaker position called probabilism that is often defended even by opponents of full Bayesianism. Uh, the fact that degrees of belief are represented mathematically allows for the precision and power of probabilism and Bayesianism, but it's also the source of much skepticism towards these views among other philosophers. I'll leave the primary discussion of this first claim that there is such a thing as degree of belief for later on, because it is one of the sources of disagreement among Bayesians. But it seems clear that although I believe that the sun will rise tomorrow, and I believe that it will not rain in Los Angeles tomorrow. I haven't checked the weather report, but it's April when I'm recording this video and it doesn't rain in April in Los Angeles very often. So I believe it won't rain in Los Angeles tomorrow and I believe the sun will rise tomorrow, but I'm far more confident that the sun will rise tomorrow. Thus, there must be some concept of degree of belief alongside the traditional epistemic notions of belief 
justification and knowledge, though the relationship of this degree of belief to those concepts is unclear. As for the second claim that uh, degrees of belief have to satisfy the probability axiom, there is no single formulation of the synchronic axioms that degrees of belief must satisfy that everyone agrees on, but the most canonical set comes from Kolmogorov. Uh, his textbook, uh, Foundations of the uh, Theory of Probability, was published. He's a Russian mathematician. He first published his book in German in 1933. 1950 is the English translation of it. But his axioms are a pure mathematical abstraction and require some interpretation to be applied to Bayesianism. I'll give a brief outline here, but there's some videos linked in the description that say more about this. Kolmogorov defines probability as just an abstract mathematical structure, which he calls a field of probabilities. There is some set E together with a collection F of subsets of E and a function P that assigns real numbers to these members of F. He gives a characterization of what F has to be like. I've got some discussion of that in the footnote, but the axioms that are often described as Kolmogorov's axioms are the three axioms on P, the probability function. First, P always takes non-negative values. Second, the probability of E, that is the probability of the set consisting of all the possibilities is one. Third, if A and B are two sets of possibilities that are disjoint from one another, uh, so that they have no elements in common, then the probability of the union of A and B, the set consisting of all of those possibilities together, is going to equal the probability of A plus the probability of B. And there's various versions of this that extend to infinite collections of sets, and that turns out to be really important for a lot of mathematical and scientific claims in some of my other work on this topic, I spend a lot of time discussing those issues for infinity, and I'll link to some of that in the description. But for now, we can ignore infinite issues and just deal with finite sets. That the basic axioms of probability are, there's something like a set of possibilities. There's some subsets of those set. Each of those subsets has its own probability. And when you put any two subsets together, if they're disjoint, then the probability of their union will be the sum of those. Each one gets a non-negative probability. And when you put them all together, the probability is one. Now, clearly these axioms are very distant from anything remotely mental or epistemic. They just, just describe an abstract mathematical set. However, if the set E is taken to be the set of epistemic possibilities for an agent, that is the things that for all you know might be the case, they're the things that you're uncertain about how the world is, and these set, the set represents all the possible ways you think the world might be. And if any proposition is identified with the set of epistemic possibilities on which it's true, so maybe there's some possibilities you think are true in which God exists, and there are some possibilities you think might be true in which God doesn't exist, and you don't know which is the case, then your probability of the claim that God exists is just the measure that this function gives to the set of possibilities in which God exists. Then now we have the start of a plausible interpretation. If we further assume that a conjunction is true in any possibilities in which the two conjuncts are, that is, A and B is true whenever A is true and B is true, and that a negation is true in every possibility in which the basic proposition isn't, so that is not A is true in all the possibilities where A isn't true, then the propositional connectives, these logical symbols of and and not, correspond to the set theoretic operations of intersecting and complementing sets. For anyone who's familiar with set theory, that should make sense. And if you're not, this is just to say there is a mathematical description of what's going on here. Of course, there are worries about just what these epistemic possibilities might be. Are they really possible worlds? They don't really exist, do they? Uh, but in order to sidestep these issues, many authors prefer to use axioms like those that Karl Popper gives, or uh, I think it's Joe Halperin, uh, that just use syntactic properties of the objects of belief rather than set theoretic properties. That is, they say sentences are the things that people have Bayesian probabilities for. 
and they ignore all the talk of possibilities. However, the mathematically orthodox way is to say there's possibilities, possible ways things could be. There are sets of those. And if we're interested in the probability of a sentence, we think about which possibilities that sentence would be true in. I will argue later that there are some advantages to the Commodore formulation in terms of the set, even if it seems implausible to identify propositions with sets of some sort. There's also a further part to the synchronic characterization of degree of belief that is at a time, which is the notion of conditional probability. This notion of conditional probability is intended to represent something like an agent's degree of belief in B on the supposition that A is true, written probability of B given A, that vertical line is the given. And so we've already given a few examples of that, the probability that the coin comes up heads three times, given that it's a fair coin. You might not know whether it's a fair coin, but you know that the probability it comes up heads three times, given that it's a fair coin is one eighth. The probability that it comes up heads three times, given that it's a double headed coin is one. Some mathematicians take conditional probability to be defined by this formula. Probability of B given A is the probability of B and A divided by the probability of A. So if we have probabilities for B and A and for A, then we can calculate the probability of this conditional probability. And some of the videos I link in the description tell you a lot more about that sort of calculation. Alan Hayek in his paper, What Conditional Probability Could Not Be, argues that conditional degree of belief has to be some pre-theoretic notion, something we understand already before we get to the mathematics just as much as degree of belief is. And therefore we have to analyze it rather than just defining it mathematically. And he raises various prob uh, problems for the idea of conditional probability. Uh, but one of the problems he focuses on is about what happens when the number zero enters into this. So he notes, since B and A is a proposition that entails A, one of the axioms of probability is going to end up guaranteeing that probability of B and A is less than or equal to the probability of A. And thus, if the probability of A is zero, then the formulation says probability of B given A is zero divided by zero, which is undefined. To avoid this problem, we might weaken the ratio formula to just say probability of B given A times probability of A equals probability of B and A. And uh, this is going to be true. If probability of A is zero, then the left side is zero. And so the right side will be zero which turns out to be consistent with everything else that is required by the axioms of probability. The problem with this axiom is that it doesn't tell us anything about what probability of B given A is when probability of A is zero. This is a strategy that Popper takes in some of his work and others do too in giving alternative accounts of the relationship between conditional and unconditional probability. And I've got a very mathematically technical paper about a lot of these alternatives for dealing with probability zero. I'll link that in the description. People who are uh, uh, mathematically adventurous might be interested in checking that out. At any rate, conditional probability, although it is a purely synchronic notion about what you conditionally believe right now if you were given other information, it plays an important role in the diachronic norms of Bayesianism, how you update your beliefs as well as in Bayesian confirmation theory, which we'll talk about in the second uh, part of the paper and many other applications of probability theory. One important theorem concerning conditional probability is Bayes' theorem. This is the one that Bayes proves in his paper. And in one form, the Bayes' theorem states that whenever all the relevant probabilities are non-zero, we can calculate probability of A given B from the probability of B given A, if we multiply by the probability of A and then divide by the probability of B. So the idea is that you can reverse the order of these conditional probabilities if you multiply by the thing that was on the right and divide by the thing that was on the left, you can switch th their order. And this is just a very simple consequence of the formula that says probability of B given A is probability of B and A divided by probability of A. 
you can just work out that this theorem will hold given that definition. Note that this theorem only deals with your beliefs and conditional beliefs at one time. That is, it's totally synchronic. So it isn't actually an update rule yet. Nothing about this theorem is distinctively Bayesian. After all, it doesn't even require that the probabilities being discussed are Bayesian probabilities, degrees of belief. It works just as well for chances or frequencies or anything else that satisfies the mathematics of probability. But as I will mention later, it does help illuminate several of the important points in Bayesian confirmation theory. In chapter one of his book, Bayes or Bust? Question mark, John Ehrman points out that the original paper by Reverend Bayes in which this theorem was proved does mark some of the earliest thinking about degrees of belief and their rational update. So Bayesianism is an appropriate name for the view, but we shouldn't assume that it's named after Bayes' theorem. The theorem is just one part of probability, but Bayesianism is about the idea that there is such a thing as Bayesian probability, that it can apply to anything you're uncertain of, not just things that are random or things that are repeatable so that you can count their frequencies. The third claim of Bayesianism gives the diachronic rules for rationality, that is how you should change your beliefs over time. And update is the technical word that Bayesians tend to use. The basic update rule that is most endorsed is called conditionalization. This rule says that updates to credences, these degrees of belief, are triggered by a basic learning event. For instance, making an observation. And that if A is the strongest proposition that you learn, then the agent's new credence in any proposition B is going to be given by the new probability of B equals the old conditional probability of B given A. That is, if all you learn is A, then your old conditional probabilities become your new probabilities. It's straightforward to verify that if the old probability function satisfied the Kolmogorov axiom, and if the old probability of A itself was non-zero, then the new probability function will also satisfy the Kolmogorov axioms, and the new probability of A, the observation you made, will be one. However, once a proposition has reached probability one, no further update by conditionalization can ever change this status, unless we conditionalize on something with probability zero, which gets into all sorts of other technical details that are beyond the scope of this paper. But uh, this fact that once you observe something, its probability goes to one and then can never change, this leads many Bayesians to endorse a slightly modified form of conditionalization due to Richard Jeffrey. The idea is we might think, even if I observe something, I don't become absolutely certain that that, ob that observation was true. I might later discover that I was making a mistake in my observation. And so Jeffrey's account allows the agent's degree of belief in A to increase by some amount as the result of the basic learning event, but without actually reaching one. He gives an example of, uh, say that you're going to a restaurant and uh, maybe your partner wanted to su surprise you with a fancy dinner and you don't know if they brought you to the French restaurant or the Italian restaurant, but you have some guests that the French restaurant would have a blue tablecloth and the Italian restaurant would have a green tablecloth. Now your partner brought you in blindfolded, you sit down, take off the blindfold, and you see it's a lovely candlelit dinner, but because it's candlelit, you can't quite tell what the color of the cloth is. You think it's probably blue, but not certain. So Jeffrey says, you should update by increasing your probability of the tablecloth being blue. Maybe it goes up to 90% rather than 100%. It goes up to 0.9 rather than one. And then everything else, such as the hypothesis that this is the French restaurant rather than the Italian restaurant is going to change in response to that. And he gives this mathematical formula for how it should change. He says, your new probability of B, that it's the French restaurant, should be your old probability of B given A, French restaurant given blue tablecloth, times the new probability of blue tablecloth, plus the old probability of B given not A, times the new probability of not A. And in the footnote, I mentioned that we can generalize this further. We don't just have to consider blue tablecloth versus not blue tablecloth. We could say, maybe you've changed blue tablecloth versus green tablecloth versus red tablecloth as a result of your observation. 
and all three of those shift somewhat and then drive everything else. There's many interesting issues about Jeffrey's rule for updating that I can't discuss here. And for instance, uh, Percy Diaconis and Sandy Isabel have a paper where they show how to view Jeffrey conditionalization as a version of the traditional conditionalization if you add some additional inexpressible propositions to your language. Hartree Field and Carl Wagner discuss how we can think of Jeffrey conditionalization and how we can formulate what it is to receive the same evidence in two different Jeffrey updates and whether Jeffrey conditionalization can satisfy the thought that it doesn't matter what order you get the evidence, it just matters what the total evidence is that you get. One interesting thing is that traditional conditionalization has that feature. Jeffrey conditionalization, it's a little harder to say how that's going to work, but it can be done. Clearly, these are not the only ways that ordinary rational agents update their beliefs. People sometimes forget things instead of learning things. And there's further complexities with other sorts of complicated situations. Uh, and I mentioned a few of them here. And all of these are discussed in philosophical papers that are raising interesting and difficult problems for Bayesians. One famous puzzle governing a strange sort of update is the Sleeping Beauty problem that Adam Elga published about, which many people have responded to. It raises some issues about the distinction between possible worlds and epistemic possibilities, as well as the extent to which self-locating information can be relevant to non-self-locating information. So self-locating information is things like, I'm in a mall, I'm lost, I'm unsure where I am, but then I find the map and the map says, you are here. And in the example of the Sleeping Beauty problem, what happens is someone's in a psychology experiment. The psychologists are going to give them some memory erasing drugs at some point. So they don't know yet if it's Monday or Tuesday. Maybe Monday's already happened and their memory's been erased, or maybe it hasn't and this is Monday. And then Elga is interested in how does learning that it's Monday change your other beliefs? Some particularly interesting responses to Elga are by David Lewis, Chris Hitchcock, uh, Darren Bradley and Hannes Leibke, Chris Meacham, Michael Teitelbaum. There's another related puzzle called the Dr. Evil puzzle, which also turns on the relevance of self-locating information to non-self-locating beliefs discussed by Adam Elga, and there's a response by Brian Weatherson. Uh, I should add, there's a lot more about this in many other sources, things like the doomsday problem and uh, uh, anthropic reasoning. You see these discussed by physicists and mathematicians as well as philosophers. Uh, there's also other problems involving forgetting, losing track of time, things like that, that Frank Arzenius discusses in one of his papers, and there's a lot more. One other thing that I didn't mention at the time I wrote this, but I think about now, is that sometimes people might even change their Bayesian probabilities without receiving any evidence, and there's a question about whether that could be rational at all. Okay, so now we'll get into the arguments for Bayesianism. Why is it that your degrees of belief, if we assume that there are such things as these Bayesian probabilities, why should they be probabilities? And the first group of arguments I'm going to consider here, these are called Dutch book arguments. Uh, this most prominent sort of argument is called the Dutch book argument. And I should say, I don't exactly know where the idea of Dutch books comes from. I think it has something to do with the fact that betting markets and capitalism developed first in Amsterdam before spreading to many other places. And so many sorts of uh, ideas related to gambling and investment are called Dutch. Uh, but this argument turns out not to support all the aspects of Bayesian doctrine. It starts with several assumptions about the mental states of rational agents, and then uses those assumptions to argue that rational agents must conform to the axioms of probability theory and must update by conditionalization. The argument itself is generally attributed to Frank Ramsey in his paper, Truth and Probability, and Bruno De Finetti for a paper published in French uh, in 1937. Although Ramsey only briefly mentions this Dutch book argument as an afterthought to a representation theorem argument, which I'll talk a bit more about later. Okay, so the Dutch book argument begins by making the assumption that for every proposition, including conjunctions and negations of other propositions, there is some price that the agent considers to be fair for a bet that pays a dollar if the proposition is true and nothing if the proposition is false. 
And what it means for a price to be fair is that you're willing to sell the bet for an amount greater than the fair price, and you're willing to buy the bet for an amount less than the fair price. So that is, uh, consider some proposition like the claim that it's going to rain tomorrow where you are. Maybe, so the, the, the claim is that there's some range of prices where if someone said, the price of a bet on rain will be 20 cents, you might think 20 cents, that's a cheap price, I will buy that bet. But 30 cents, that's too much. I wouldn't buy it for 30 cents, so I would sell it. And what it means to buy a bet is that I would pay someone 20 cents, and then tomorrow we figure out if it rains, I get a dollar. If it doesn't rain, I get nothing and just lost my original 20 cents. Whereas if I'm selling it for 30 cents, that means someone else pays me 30 cents. And then if it rains, I give them a dollar. And if it doesn't rain, I give them nothing. So uh, the idea is the claim is there's some fair price and you'll buy the bet for any amount less than that price and you'll sell the bet for any amount greater than that price. Additionally, we assume that the agent is, if they're willing to buy or sell one bet at a certain price, then that price doesn't get affected by which other bets they've already bought and sold, unless they've gained some new information. But let's assume that throughout this process of buying and selling bets, they're not learning anything new. They're just, maybe they're standing at the counter of some fancy uh, betting track. It's not a horse race betting. They're betting on anything. And there's a bunch of prices listed and they say, okay, I'll buy this one, I'll sell that one, I'll buy this one, I'll sell that one, because these ones are below or above the price that I find uh, fair. And it might be helpful to imagine these people as uh, insurance agents or stock market bettors uh, uh, rather than just as gamblers. But the idea is there's a theorem, a mathematical theorem we can prove that if the fair prices that you have don't satisfy Kolmogorov's axioms, then there's a set of bets that you'd be willing to buy and sell that together guarantee that you lose money. So as a just brief illustration of this, imagine that you thought the fair price for a bet on rain was 40 cents. And you also thought that the fair price for a bet on not rain was 40 cents. If you thought both of those were good at 40 cents, then that means someone else might come up to you. You might sell both of these bets for 45 cents each. So I'll sell a bet on rain for 45 cents. I'll sell a bet on not rain for 45 cents. I've collected 90 cents now in these two payments. But tomorrow, if it rains, I pay out a dollar. And if it doesn't rain, I also pay out a dollar. Either way, I'm guaranteed to lose money. And so the idea is you shouldn't have prices for these bets of 40 cents for rain and 40 cents for not rain. If you've got 40 cents for rain, then 60 cents for not rain would make sense. If you had 40 cents for not rain, then 60 cents for rain would make sense. Or you could be 50-50 or 30-70, but these prices would have to add up to exactly a dollar or else there's a set of bets that you're willing to buy together that would guarantee you lose money if your prices add up to more than a dollar, or there'd be a set of bets you'd be willing to sell that guarantee you lose money if your prices add up to less than a dollar. Conversely, if the prices do satisfy Kolmogorov's axioms, then you're not susceptible to a Dutch book like this. Though Hayek points out in the paper that there might be some other problems that still arise for you. Uh, I'll link in the description to a video that goes into many, many more details about how this Dutch book theorem works. For now, I'll talk about the philosophical implications of this theorem and what it means. So we have to be careful first in stating just what it means to guarantee a loss of money. In some sense, if, if you think there's some possible, if, if A happens to be false, if it doesn't rain tomorrow, then any amount that I'm willing to pay for a bet on rain, I forget if I said it won't rain or it will rain, but anyway, if it won't rain tomorrow, then any amount I'm willing to spend on a bet that uh, in favor of rain is going to be is going to guarantee I lose money. However, this is not guarantee in the subjective sense. The guarantee I think has to be subjective. It must mean that if I see some possibility on which my bet wins, then I can't guarantee that I will lose money. And this is the sense of guarantee that's needed. 
if I know it's going to either rain or not rain, then I can already tell that putting my prices at 40 cents for both would guarantee that I lose money. However, if I think it might rain and it might not rain, just my price of 40 cents and 60 cents together, these would not guarantee any loss. I could take one side of the bet and then I might lose or I might win. Or I could take the other side and I might lose or I might win, as far as I can tell. On this subjective notion of guarantee, it seems clear that a guaranteed loss of money is irrational. If I can already tell in advance that I'm going to lose money, then I shouldn't make those bets. And thus, this argument seems to show that a rational agent has to satisfy uh, Kolmogorov's axioms. And I've got a footnote about other concepts of possibility, metaphysical possibility, logical possibility, rather than my own epistemic possibility. And I think those make some of the problems for Bayesianism that I'll talk about in the second part of this paper much worse. Authors who prefer a more syntactic axiomatization of probability, that is, in terms of sentences rather than possibilities, uh, they are going to have to modify this concept of guarantee. And I think the prospects for this seem much more problematic. What does it mean to guarantee that a set of sentences is false? I think the best way to understand that is in terms of what possibilities you think might occur. And as long as there's some possibility in which you win, we can't prove to you that you are irrational. It's only if you can tell that there's no possibility, or if you think there's no possibility in which you win, then you're being irrational in making those bets. This notion of guarantee is sometimes spelled out in terms of a Dutch bookie who actually makes the bets to take advantage of you. That is, they see your prices and they offer you a bunch of bets that you're willing to accept, and then they somehow guarantee a win. Now, the problem is if we think of it that way, then this person who's making the bets, in order to prove you're irrational, they must not know anything more than the agent herself. But I think the purely internal arguments about what the agent herself can tell about the possibilities of winning and losing is more convincing as an illustration of the inconsistency of the agent's premises or preferences. Now, these assumptions of this argument are clearly unrealistic. It seems that most people aren't willing to just buy and sell bets on everything at precisely one price. They're risk averse, meaning that there's a gap between the price at which they're willing to buy a bet and the price at which they're willing to sell a bet. And most agents' willingness to buy and sell bets is strongly affected by whether they hold other bets that are complementary. After all, this is why people buy insurance. If you own a home, that the existence of that home that you own is effectively a bet that the home won't burn down. If it burns down, you have nothing. And if it doesn't burn down, you have a home. So many people buy insurance. If they own a home, they also buy insurance. Insurance is basically a bet on the other side. An insurance policy is something where you pay some money to the company. And if your home burns down, you get, in, you get money. And if it doesn't, you get nothing. So an a fire insurance policy is a bet that your home will burn down. Your home is a bet that your home won't burn down. If an agent had a uniform fair price for buying and selling, and if this price were determined solely by her degree of belief in the proposition, then the assumptions of the argument would be true. And furthermore, these fair prices would provide a way to assign numerical values to degrees of belief. The idea is we start out with some concept. There is a concept of degree of belief. How do we put numbers on it? The Dutch book argument says, measure it by how much you're willing to pay for bets. If there is some fair price such that you'll buy at any price below it and sell at any price above, then that price is your degree of belief. And in fact, some followers of Ramsey and Dave Nutty just use this as the definition of degree of belief in order to give operational meaning to this theoretical term, this Bayesian probability. On this interpretation, the assumptions of the Dutch book argument just are the first claim of Bayesianism, the idea that there is a thing as Bayesian probability, together with this package principle requiring that if you're willing to buy or sell each bet individually, then you'd be willing to buy or sell all of them together. And if we accept all that, if we accept that your degree of belief is the price at which you're willing to buy or sell, and that you're willing to buy or sell any combination uh, that you individually find fair, then we can show that if 
uh, if your degrees of belief don't satisfy the probability axioms, then there's a collection of bets you're willing to buy or sell that you can already tell they will together guarantee that you lose money. And a rational person wouldn't be like that. So a rational person would have prices that match the probability axioms. David Christensen points out that we don't need to make the full unrealistic assumptions for this argument to go through. We don't need to assume that you will buy or sell bets at those prices and that your buying and selling is unconnected to whether or not you already have bets and so on. We can just assume that there is some Bayesian concept of degree of belief and that this concept justifies you in deeming certain bets favorable Maybe it's a favorable bet, but you're still not willing to buy it because you're risk averse and certain bets are unfavorable. And then we assume that your own, you're not justified in deeming a combination of bets favorable. Uh, well, so they, we assume that you, you are justified in deeming a combination of bets favorable if you're justified in deeming each individual bet favorable. And finally, that you're never justified in deeming favorable a combination of bets that you can already tell are guaranteed to lose money. So the Dutch book theorem shows an agent will violate Kolmogorov's axioms if and only if there is a Dutch book collection of bets that guarantee you lose money, each of which is a bet that you would individually be justified in deeming fair. And thus, a rational agent who doesn't ever uh, find Dutch books to be favorable will never violate Kolmogorov's axioms. So that's the basic Dutch book argument for the axioms of probability. And you can look at these other videos for the details of the axioms and the details of what those bets look like that guarantee you lose money. To justify further claims about conditional probability, the argument needs to be extended. We define a conditional bet on A given B to be one that pays a dollar if A and B are both true, pays nothing if A is false and B is true, but which you get a refund of your original price if B is false. So the idea is we might say, uh, maybe there's a football game tomorrow and maybe we don't know whether it's going to rain or not. And I say, I am willing to bet 60 cents for a dollar that the one team will win if it doesn't rain. And so we might agree to that bet so that if it rains, the bet gets canceled and we both get our refund. But if the bet, if, the, if it doesn't rain, then the bet goes through and I get a dollar if team A wins and nothing if they lose. And now if we assume that your conditional degree of belief probability of A given B specifies the fair price for this bet, then you're vulnerable to a conditional Dutch book if and only if you violate this constraint. Probability of A given B times probability of B equals probability of A and B. And again, if you look at some of the videos in the description, they will give the specific set of bets that guarantee that these are the prices you have, these prices have to obey this relationship. As arguments for the diachronic claims of Bayesianism about how you have to change your beliefs, Dutch books are more problematic. Instead of considering a set of bets that you're willing to accept all at once, you have to consider a set of bets that you're willing to accept over time with the payoffs delayed until the end, of course, so that you don't get any information from some of these payoffs, such that the final outcome is guaranteed to be a loss. But we have to be very careful with which sequences of bets do this. For instance, there's an apparent Dutch book argument against an agent ever changing her degrees of belief. If there's one time at which your degree of belief is P, say at one point, you're 30% confident that it's going to rain, and another time at which it's P minus epsilon, say 27% confident that it's going to rain, if you can ever change your degrees of belief like this, then at the one time when your degree of belief is 30 cents, you're willing to pay 29 cents for a bet that gives you a dollar if it rains. Now you get a bit of information, you become less confident in the rain, it goes down to 27%. Now you're willing to sell the bet on rain for 28 cents, since this is more than your new degree of belief. And since the payoffs of these two bets are going to cancel out, now the net result is just that you've lost one cent. That looks like it's a guaranteed loss. However, again, we have to look back at what it is to guarantee the loss. We have to appeal to this notion of guarantee from above to clear this up. 
this sequence of bets only guarantees a loss if every epistemic possibility that you countenanced at the start involved this particular change of credence. If you start out thinking that uh, uh, willing to offer 30 cents for a bet on rain and uh, know for sure that your degree of belief is going to go down to 27%, then that's a problem. But if some possibilities involve starting out at 30% and going down to 27, and others involve starting at 30% and going up, then this sequence of bets doesn't guarantee a loss. You may, you may end up in a state where you later see that you're guaranteed a loss given the bets you've already made. But this is a risk that comes with any gamble. Once you've made a bet, once the bet is resolved, you can see that that bet guarantees you're going to lose. However, the argument does illustrate an important constraint on updating known as reflection, one version of which states that if you're certain about what your future degrees of belief will be, then you should already have those degrees of belief. If I'm certain that tomorrow I'm only going to think 27% chance of rain, then I should already think 27% chance of rain tomorrow. Otherwise, if I start with a different probability now and I'm certain that tomorrow I'm going to have a different one, then uh, this sequence of bets would be guaranteed to make me lose money. I should make sure that my current degree of belief, if there's some possibility it goes down in the future, there should also be some possibility it goes up. This constraint was introduced by Bas von Frossen, and it's been discussed quite a lot in, recent, in subsequent literature. David Christensen, Bas von Frossen, Adam Elga, among others. There's a really good paper by Ray Briggs that came out around the time that I wrote this, uh, and there's many others. Dutch book arguments for update by conditionalization go back to Paul Teller's paper in 1973, though Teller attributes the argument itself to David Lewis. Teller's argument only applies to a case where an agent knows in advance that she will learn which piece of evidence EI is true, uh, where it's also known in advance that exactly one of the EIs is true. So for instance, maybe you're about to uh, take a measurement on some instrument and you know what all the possible values of that measurement might be. And his argument is going to be, once you learn which measurement comes out, you should change your degree of belief to your old degree of belief conditional on that measurement. And so if you have some non-zero degree of belief in E1, and yet you knew that on learning E1, your degree of belief in A would become something different than probability of A given E1, then you'd be willing to currently buy a conditional bet on A given E1 together with a small bet on E1. And if E1 was true, then you'd sell a bet on A such that together these three bets would guarantee a loss. And Brad Arment generalizes this argument to show that even if you don't learn which EI is true, if the EI form the partition whose credence shift drives the rest of the update, then you're going to have to go via Jeffrey conditionalization. Again, the details of those arguments are in these other papers, but the idea is that, again, there's a Dutch book argument. If you know how you're going to update your degrees of belief in light of new evidence, then the way you update it has to be via conditionalization. And if you know you're going to do it in a way that is not giving you certainty, it's going to have to be via Jeffrey conditionalization. Otherwise, there's a set of bets you'd be willing to make now and in the future that would together guarantee that you lose money. The conditions under which Teller's argument is valid are not totally general, but this is to be expected because even most Bayesians admit that conditionalization is not the most general rule for updating degrees of belief, even though conditionalization and its generalized version by Jeffrey are generally considered the two most important procedures. That is, uh, there might be cases in which you change your mind in some way other than learning for sure that one thing is true or shifting a particular set of options in a particular way. Thus, Dutch book arguments have been used to support the synchronic at a time and diachronic across time claims of Bayesianism, in addition to helping give meaning to the primary claim that belief can come in degrees. We give that meaning by means of these prices. However, the assumptions about fair betting prices that are needed seem unduly strong to many people. Additionally, the inconsistency that they point to is an inconsistency of preferences rather than of beliefs. So many epistemologists are worried that this can't be an argument for an epistemic conclusion. 
Diachronic Dutch books also raise several new worries, as David Christensen points out, as do Dutch books involving infinitely ma many bets, such as Van McGee and Tim Williamson point out. Thus, a lot of skepticism surrounds Dutch book arguments. So other arguments for Bayesianism are often considered as well. One of the interesting things is that there are so many different ways that we can converge on this particular concept of Bayesian probability and that it should be probability. Second argument, the representation theorems. Another sort of argument that has been quite prominent in favor of Bayesianism is an argument by a representation theorem. Probably the best reconstruction of the primary argument that Frank Ramsey gives in truth and probability is as one of these representation theorem arguments. Versions of this argument are stated more fully in Leonard Savage's textbook, The Logic of Decision, in Richard Jeffrey's book, uh, I forget what his is called, and uh, Jim Joyce's book uh, on causal decision theory. Rather than assuming that agents have fair betting prices, where you make bets on propositions involving dollars, you just make assumptions about an agent's preferences among various actions. However, these preferences have to consider all possible actions and not just the ones traditionally considered bets. And the idea here is basically what I was getting at earlier on when I said, if you own a house, the act of owning a house is in some sense a bet that the house will not burn down because the value of the house goes away if it's burned down. Similarly, the act of crossing a street is a bet that there's not a speeding driver coming around the corner about to hit you. And the idea is every action that depends in any way on the uncertainty of the world is a gamble. Whether it's crossing the street, getting on a plane, going into a restaurant without a mask, uh, traveling across the ocean to a country that may or may not be at war by the time you land. All of these things are gambles where you get some benefits if things go as you hoped, and you pay some costs if things don't go as you hoped. And the idea is that the representation theorem is going to tell us how to measure the values that you put on these different outcomes and use that measurement of these values to measure your degrees of belief. We're going to represent these all with numbers. Some of the assumptions for the representation theorem are primarily structural such as the assumption that agents have preferences among all actions. Actions here is in scare quotes because it's going to include anything that can be defined by a function from epistemic possibilities to outcomes, regardless of whether or not there's an action with that sort of payoff table. This seems reasonable for straightforward bets. If I can place a bet where I win a dollar if P is true and lose a dollar if P is false, I could also place the converse bet where I win a dollar if P is false and lose a dollar if P is true. But since we want to discuss all of the agent's preferences, all of these mappings of possibilities to outcomes have to be considered. This means that if there's an action, say, leaving your umbrella at home, where you get a soggy walk if it's raining and a dry unencumbered walk otherwise, then there's also going to have to be some hypothetical action that you consider that gives you a dry unencumbered walk if it rains and a soggy walk if it doesn't. Obviously, there is no actual action you could do that would yield those outcomes. This seems like quite an unrealistic action, but the requirement is just that you have some sort of preference ranking of how good this action would be compared to all the other actual or hypothetical actions that you could do or couldn't do, but anything you could imagine. The other assumptions are more substantively about the preferences. A few common assumptions are transitivity. If you prefer action A to action B and action B to action C, then you must prefer A to C. And dominance. If you prefer an action that guarantees outcome O1 to an action that guarantees outcome O2, then you must prefer A prime to A, where the difference between A prime and A is only that a prime sometimes has O1, where A would have had O2. So if one outcome is always is better than another, then an action with some chances of giving the good outcome rather than the bad one is better than another action that's the same in all other possibilities, but sometimes gives you the bad outcome. 
For each of these relevant set of assumptions, we can prove a theorem that states that any agent whose preferences obey these axioms must be representable in a special way. In particular, there's a function u, a utility function, from the outcomes to the real numbers. It measures how good you find those outcomes to be. And a function p from the propositions to the real numbers in 0, 1, such that the agent prefers action A to action B if and only if this equation is true, or this inequality is true. That is the sum of, over all utilities X, of X times the probability that the utility of the action is X for the one action is greater than the sum over all possible outcomes X, where of X times the probability of action B resulting in utility X. So if this sum, this sum is called the expected value, if the expected value of A is greater than the expected value of B, then you prefer A to B. The idea is um, from looking at your preferences among all the possible actions, we could figure out what might be some numbers that represent how much you find these outcomes desirable or undesirable, and what might be some numbers that represent how you find these propositions, probable or improbable. And it's going to turn out, if we do this right, that your preferences correspond to this expected value function being higher on the ones that you prefer and lower on the ones you don't prefer. And the idea is that each outcome makes a contribution to the expected value of its act that is proportional both to the probability of the outcome and the value of the outcome. Highly probable outcomes make big differences, but also highly valuable outcomes make big differences, whether that value is positive or negative. If the assumptions that we made are strong enough in the representation theorem, then we can show that the function p that we use in this is unique, and it satisfies the probability axioms. And there's also, the function u is also almost unique. That is, there's some choice of what the unit is that we measure utility in. Maybe one unit of utility is the amount of getting one extra Oreo after dinner. Or maybe the unit of utility is the value of uh, getting your dream job. Either of those might be the unit we use to measure the utility, but the utility function is just going to be unique up to the scale, this unit, and the zero point. What do we consider the default? And we can reach. Uh, we can change that around, just as we can change temperature from the Fahrenheit scale to the centigrade scale. We, we move where the zero is, and we move the size of the unit. Then the theorist makes one final leap and says that U represents the agent's utilities, how desirable you find the various outcomes, and P represents your probabilities, how believable you find the various propositions, the Bayesian probability. This identification is supported by the intuitive fact the preferences govern actions, just as desires and beliefs do, and that the calculation, this sum over all outcomes of x times the probability of the utility of your act being x, is the standard expected utility used in decision theory to represent the notion of rational preference between actions. There are several points at which these arguments have been criticized. Lyle Zinda has shown that Alternate representations will also be compatible with the axioms on preference, raising the question of why the probabilistic representation is singled out as giving the agent's degree of belief. In some of my other work, I end up arguing that these alternative representations that Zinda comes up with, these are just as good a representation, just as Fahrenheit and centigrade are equally good representations. Additionally, both the structural and the substantive axioms on preference seem to conflict with various intuitively permissible sets of preferences, as in the paradoxes of Allais and Ellsberg. Allais has a paradox that involves risk aversion, where people would rather take guaranteed million dollars rather than a chance at a much bigger payoff with some tiny chance of nothing. And Ellsberg uh, has a paradox involving vagueness, where I don't tell you how many red and black and yellow balls are in the urn, and I give you choices between various gambles on those. And uh, people often choose gambles that don't satisfy the probability axioms. There's also a vast literature on the apparent inadequacies of the sort of decision theory that the representation theorem assumes, independent of any critique of the particular axioms. 
Frederick Schick follows the psychological literature stemming from Kahneman and Tversky in pointing out the importance of context in decision making, which expect utility theory leaves out. Some people interpret that whole literature as showing that in certain contexts, people make irrational choices because uh, if you give people a choice between uh, uh, an act that guarantees that 400 people die versus one with a chance that all 600 die, they'll make a different choice than if you make a, give, ask them between an act that guarantees that 200 people survive versus having a risk, a chance that all 600 survive. These are the same decision pointed in two different ways, but people make the decision differently based on the description. They say it's irrational. Schick says, maybe this is a different concept of rationality. Nover and Hayek and Frank Arsenius and various others point out serious problems that expected utility faces with infinity. Some of my other papers on this matter actually are trying to deal with those puzzle cases. Although the representation theorem doesn't directly assume the existence of fair prices for bets, standard decision theory is going to guarantee that those fair prices do exist. So some of the worries about Dutch book arguments will be translated into worries about decision theory. And finally, these representation theorems don't directly put any constraints on the diachronic change of degrees of belief. So they're at best a partial vindication of Bayesianism. However, the fact that decision theory has been such a fruitful field of study in its own right gives representation theorems some important additional interest for psychologists, economists, political theorists, and others, independent of their connection to Bayesianism. Last section of this paper, other arguments for Bayesianism. At the time this paper was written, I didn't focus as much on other arguments. Some of these have become more prominent in philosophical writing since then. There's a variety of other arguments that have been given in favor of Bayesianism to make up for the flaws that these two are seen to have. Some of these are refinements of parts of the others, but don't exactly fit under either category, such as Bas von Frassen's 1999 paper and the Graves and Wallace 2006 paper. One particular feature that all of these arguments seem to share is that they derive these rational constraints on degree of belief, this epistemic thing, from apparently pragmatic constraints on what you should prefer, what you should do, what you should bet. This is seen by many to be a failing, since some epistemologists think that epistemic norms, ideas about what you should believe, and practical norms about what you should do, seem to be two different sorts of things. Thus, Jim Joyce in his 1998 paper gives a non-pragmatic vindication of probabilism. And he gives an argument based on measurements of accuracy of probabilistic predictions. And uh, he gives a slightly updated version in his 2005 paper. This accuracy-based argument is one that has become a lot more prominent in the decade since I wrote this paper. I'll see if I can find some useful things to link in the description for that. Another non-pragmatic argument that has been quite popular among Bayesian physicists is that given by, I think it's Richard Cox, and it's repeated in chapter two of E.T. James's book. The basic assumptions of this argument are that any set of evidence gives a unique plausibility to any proposition, <coughs> and that there's some function relating the plausibility of logically complex propositions to the plausibilities of its components. From just these assumptions alone, that there is a unique plausibility for every proposition and that these plausibilities have to be related in a functional way, we can then prove that in fact, these degrees of plausibility must have the specific structure that's entailed by the Kolmogorov axioms. Additionally, Jaynes shows we can derive some version of the principle of indifference, which I'll talk about later uh, in the next uh, video, according to which propositions that have equal support from the set of evidence must have equal probability. Now, Halpern, Joe Halpern argues that the assumptions of Cox's theorem are far too strong to be supported. The assumption that there is a unique rational set of degrees of belief in any evidential situation is one that even many Bayesians find hard to swallow. So remember, this means you walk into the magic shop, you pick up a coin, there is some precise number that is the number that you should have for whether this coin is a double-headed coin or uh, an ordinary fair coin. Many Bayesians think different people could have different beliefs here. 
even given the same evidence, and each one would be equally rational as long as they're internally consistent. But Cox's theorem assumes there's a unique answer that's the correct one. Halpern additionally worries about the infinitary structure that's required on the space of possibilities in order for Cox's theorem to work. However, despite all the apparent flaws in each of these arguments for Bayesianism, there's still many Bayesians. One reason is summed up in this quote by David Christensen. Neither the Dutch book nor the representation theorem comes close to being a knockdown argument for probabilism. And non-probabilists will find contestable assumptions in both. But each one, I think, provides probabilism with interesting and non-question begging intuitive support. And that may be the best one can hope for in thinking about our most basic principles of rationality. But another reason many people support Bayesianism is because of the many apparent successes of the theory and its great fruitfulness in dealing with old questions in epistemology and the philosophy of science, as well as in raising new ones. I'll discuss these successes and further questions that they raise in the next paper. <laughs>